Expanding minds and hearts to reach for the reality of heaven. This is Fathom Ministries Podcast. Hi, I'm Nathan Reynolds. Welcome to another Bible lesson that I hope you find inspiring and informative. Please look for the handout link for this study in the description box down below. God bless you. So tonight, the uh, lesson is our third lesson in Acts. The book of Acts, uh, lesson three, we've been hovering between chapter one and chapter two to talk about the Holy Spirit and what it meant before Pentecost. I want to get to chapter two, and I want to talk about the things in chapter two and beyond. But to properly appreciate that, it is very, very important to understand what the setup is from God's perspective. What did he do to set up chapter two, the day of Pentecost, He did a lot, and tonight, that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about how God used Jesus to set up uh, the stage. There's a stage being set, and it's dramatic. We're going to end tonight in a dramatic retelling of a story and a dramatic end to what we're going to talk about because we want this to impact you. We want want this to uh, make... Uh, Acts chapter 2 as rich to you as possible because that is such a significant moment in time. So some of the things I want to bring up, we're going to start with talking things like uh, looking at progressive revelation about the being of God. (laughs) This is a big subject, the being of God. Um, but the being of God, that is all that God is, okay? Just like you are not just your body, you are also your soul and your spirit. And even when you die and you, you go to be with the Lord, you still live because your kids and your family love you and they still think about you just as I love and think about my dad probably every day. Uh, and he still informs me, and he still trains me. And I remember the words that he said to me. My wife bought me this for Christmas, and I was hanging it on the wall. And I, I told her, I said, "Hey, I, I got to go get my my measuring uh, yardstick, because my old pappy used to say, uh, measure twice and cut once, or measure once and cut twice." <laughs> How many has ever heard that thing? Well, that is true. (laughs) If you don't measure and carefully make sure you get the measurement right, it is going to end up (laughs) a mess on you. You're going to end up cutting uh, twice, and you may have to go get another board because you cut it too short. (laughs) Um, So uh, we're going to talk about the being of God, and there's no way we can ever explore all of what that is. But Jesus makes it an issue. And it's an issue because you can't talk about the Holy Spirit and and understand how important the Holy Spirit is unless you start talking about God and you talk about Jesus and you talk about the Holy Spirit in the context of what is this and why is it important to understand these details. Um, <laughs> we are going to also be discussing something that, I've never heard anybody discuss before, ever, ever in my life have I heard this. But Jesus comes along and he changes our view of God from a distant character to Father. And you may not realize that when you're going through the New Testament and how much God the Father comes up. But the term God the Father is not even once in the Old Testament. Did you know that? Not once is it said, God the Father. But God as Father is in the Old Testament. So Jesus comes along and he highlights this for a reason. Why? Because Jesus is here and he came from heaven 
and he wants to tell us what he knows that we need to know about God the Father. And he also has to put it in that setting because he is the Son of God. And you don't have a Son of God unless you have God the Father. So he has to close that loop first, and then he's going to talk about the Holy Spirit of God, which is also a significant and only person that you and I correspond to in this world because Jesus is sitting on the throne of God, the Father in heaven. And it is the Holy Spirit that we, with which we have to do in the earth first and foremost. So these are what Acts chapter 2 is talking about. It's talking about when that moment came where this stuff became an issue. So we're also going to be looking at how Jesus introduced and personalized not only the Father, but the Holy Spirit. And so this becomes a very big issue. And then Jesus sets his own role in the middle of all of this so that he can show how it corresponds to the Father and the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at a preview from the great reformer, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther of the 1500s, who is the father of the Protestant movement, of whom we would not be here today talking about uh, our church and our beliefs We would all be Catholics if it wasn't for people like, and especially Martin Luther. So I'm going to bring you a quote from him that's very relevant about this subject. And then Jesus outlines expectations with regards to the ministry of the Holy Spirit that's coming after the resurrection. The resurrection is key. There's no forgiveness of sins for anybody, not past, present, or future, unless Jesus is resurrected from the dead. It isn't important just that Jesus came. All of us have come. It isn't that important that Jesus was a prophet. There's been many prophets. It wasn't even important that Jesus died on the cross. Everybody that lives dies unless there is a resurrection from the dead because that is what set him apart as God Almighty, the Son of God, the one who had the power to raise himself from the dead. That is who Jesus is. And that resurrection is the key point that you need to teach and stress and emphasize to your kids as they grow up. A resurrection is an unheard of thing. And you've got to make sure your kids understand the the importance of resurrection. And then finally, we are going to look at that dramatic invitation to the gospel and the Holy Spirit that was to come on the day of Pentecost that Jesus did. And we're going to end our lesson tonight with that. All right, let's move. Acts chapter 1, verses uh, 1 through 5. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up into heaven after he had given orders by the Holy Spirit. You see what's happening here? All of a sudden, Luke starts emphasizing not just Jesus, not just Jesus' words, not just, you know, generic God. Jesus is operating, but by the Holy Spirit. There's this connection being made that is important, and it follows all the way through the New Testament. And it constantly is keeping in orbit these Father, Son, Holy Spirit, each distinguishably different, and yet all one being, the being of Almighty God who cannot be separated, cannot be three gods, cannot be 30 gods, cannot be a 100 gods. There is only one God. And so this is constantly emphasized, the, the parts that are of God that make up the being of God and yet are distinguished as different. So Don't miss the inclusion of the Holy Spirit in everything that we say. And watch for that same inclusion of God the Father throughout the New Testament as we look at it. Now, there's something else here I want to note before we read on. And that is that our faith is supported by facts. We are not those 
who have a religious faith that is just a bizarre fantasy that's not supported by facts. Look at what it says here. It says, he, Jesus, had given orders by the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself. It's like, here I am. Here's the facts. He presented himself alive after his suffering. And of course, that means after his resurrection by many convincing proofs. The people who saw Jesus resurrect, when they saw him after the resurrection, these people were so convinced that 11 out of the 12 disciples, apostles died martyrs. And all they had to do was say, I lied. He didn't resurrect. I didn't see what I said I saw. And they would have lived their full life. But they did not. They stood their ground by the power of the Holy Spirit and said, no, we cannot lie. Jesus Christ is not dead. He's not still in the tomb. We saw him raised up after he was crucified and buried in the tomb. And he laid there for three days. And then we saw the nail scars in his hands. Convincing proofs. Our faith is based on convincing proofs. You should be spending your whole life Digging, digging, digging for those proofs so that you will not think you have eternal life. But the Bible says so that you will know that you have eternal life. And so it says, so he appeared to them for a period of 40 days. And speaking of things regarding the kingdom of God, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the promise, what the father had promised which he said, you heard of from me. Look at how that's worded. This is Luke writing, but he puts these in quotes here and he's making a very interesting specific point. He says, to wait for uh, for what the father had promised, quote, which, end of quote, he's saying, Jesus said, which, by the way, quote, you heard from me. In other words, the father God the Father sent it, but I told you about it. Our goal of the study is to look back at what happened on the day of Pentecost and to outline the significance of God's unveiling of the Holy Spirit in a new and a powerful way, giving birth to the church and the church age. Very significant. Church age is not Israel's age, and Israel's age is not the church age. It's why the church has nothing to do with the Great Tribulation period because that isn't the church age, that's Israel's age. How do I know? Daniel's 70th week, he said, 70 weeks are determined on your people. The week is seven years times 70, 490 years. So 69 weeks has already taken place, uh, 483 years. There's seven years left. That seven-year period is the Tribulation period has nothing to do with the church age. So church age, Israel's age, two different things. That's why when Jesus came and he offered them the kingdom, they rejected it. He withdrew the offer of the kingdom and started preparing to uh, commence with beginning the Gentile church, and that's what he did. And on the day of Pentecost, chapter 2 of Acts, he started a Gentile church with a bunch of Jews. (laughs) But eventually it would become predominantly Gentile, as it is today. In the Old Testament, the concept of God Yahweh, right? You guys know that? The name of God is Yahweh, right? Not Jehovah. Don't use the word Jehovah. There's no such word. It's Yahweh. Yahweh did not distinguish God with details regarding his being. When Moses asked God, who are you? Who do I say sent me? Anybody know what he said? He gave a weird weird answer. Why he said, why do you ask me who sent you? I am. You tell him I am sent you. Why? What do you think? Because I am means I am like no other. I am always in my being. I have always been, will always be. I am. I am. What there's nothing that says being like I am, right? I am. I'm everything, right? And that's not bragging if you are. (laughs) That's what it is, right? So in the Old Testament, he didn't distinguish himself immediately with all the information. That's why we call it 
progressive revelation. That's what the Bible is. You start in Genesis and you move your way all the way to Revelation, you're looking at progressive revelation. <clears throat> okay? So he didn't give us the details regarding his being until time went on. And especially in the Old Testament, he didn't make it clear that he was going to be distinctive as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That was not clear in the Old Testament. As with all bib biblical doctrine, in time God would progressively reveal more and more about himself to the Jews. And he interacted personally with his people, especially the prophets. And through time and deep revealing of himself in the Old Testament to the prophets, there was this thing called progressive revelation that had continued until the canon of scripture was closed. And that means until the book of Revelation, because from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is now complete. There is no more progressive revelation. People who come along like Joseph Smith and they go, okay, yeah, we take the Bible, but we want to go beyond that. That's baloney, and it's heresy, and it's damnable, okay? Progressive revelation is not continuing. And when they come to my door, what I say is, what? When did, when did you guys start? 300 years ago? Well, God, he couldn't bring his message to fruition until 300 years ago? What's wrong with your God? He's, is he incompetent? He, he, he had to wait until just three, 400 years ago, and now... He came along with someone else with something. And by the way, what's coming next? What else is going to come along that tell us something about God that's going to disqualify what you believe? Nothing. Because there is no more progressive revelation. I like uh, what uh, Andy Wood says, and I, I'm stealing this from him. And that is, is that uh, there is progressive illumination for the individual believer. Progressive illumination is what happens to us because we have a Bible, but we can't quote the whole Bible. We're learning the Bible. We're becoming progressively illuminated by Scripture. That's what's happening to us. So we grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ through Scripture. As we reach the New Testament era and hear from Jesus himself, a whole new world of detail emerges about the distinguishability within the being of God as he revealed the beauty of his complete oneness in the triunity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one who reveals these aspects of the being of God that makes up the whole. This is very important. An example of this is how Jesus uh, repositioned the concept of the Old Testament God as being best described in his distinguishability from Jesus the Son as God the Father. That's why I'm saying, remember, you didn't need to know about God the Father until you had a Son of God, and now you definitely need it, or else Jesus is an imposter, unless you understand the relationship between the Father and the Son. And this is no modalism, this is actualism. And Jesus talks of it as actualism, not modalism. Uh, it's not God acting as a father and acting as a son and acting as a spirit. He is those things, and it's important to know that. In the Old Testament, God the Father was not stated, God as God the Father, but it was alluded to. It, it just wasn't emphasized. Look at the following complete list. Listen, you guys. Here's a complete list. I've looked for all of them. All of them. In the Old Testament. How many books are in the Old Testament? 39. How many books are in the New Testament? 27. 39 books. Nine times God is called Father, but he's never called God the Father. Watch. Exodus 4.20. Two, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my son, my firstborn. Did it say God was father there? Yes. Not in those words, but it's saying God is a father. Israel is his son. Uh, Deuteronomy 32.6, speaking of God, 
Is he not your father? It asks. In uh, 1 Chronicles 29.10, David said, Blessed are you, God of Israel, our father. Right? And then Isaiah 63.16, speaking of God, for you are our father. And then Isaiah 64, 8, but now, O Lord, you are our father. Jeremiah 3, 19, you shall call me my father. Jeremiah 31, 9, looks the same, but it's not. Jeremiah 31, 9 says, for I am a father to Israel. Here's a question in Malachi 1, 6. God says, if I am a father... Where is my honor? Malachi 2.10, God declares, do we not all have one father? So there you have it. Nine times in the Old Testament, what does this do? It buttresses so that nobody could say of Jesus, don't call God the father. So here come the Muslims along with, oh yeah, we believe in Jesus of the New Testament. But God is not a father, and he has no son. That's what they say. You know what that makes them? Liars. That doctrine is doctrines of demons. That's what that means, because it's declaring the opposite of what's in your Bible. So Jesus comes along. He declares God to be God the Father, and he distinguishes him as separate from the Son. Contrast this list from the Old Testament to just the four Gospels in the New Testament. Look at this. God is referred to as Father 184 times in the Gospels alone. Nine times in the Old Testament, 184 times in the first four books of the New Testament. Have you ever heard anybody preach this before or teach it? Ever? The Gospel of John is by far where the majority of these references to God as the Father is. 116 times in one book. That book is the book that emphasizes the deity and the God of who Jesus is. That's John, the book of John. That's why it's the first book you should read, as I told you guys when you first started coming. Um, the Synoptic Gospels, you know what that is. This is the Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they are all following the same account and the same storyline, the same chronology, pretty much. Not exactly, but pretty much. And so they're called Synoptic Gospels. How many times is Father in there? 68 times. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Old Testament, uh, that's three books. Old Testament, how many books? 39. And there's how many times is God referred to as the Father there? Nine. <laughs> You see this? Pretty important. Uh, the church letters, we call them epistles, right? The God as Father is mentioned 78 times. You know what that means? 78. In other words, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 68 times. Acts to Revelation, 78 times, means that it is appropriate to understand this is no modal position of God. This is the position of God that Jesus introduced that was alluded to in the Old Testament, specific, specified in the New by Jesus in the Gospels, and yet continued even more so, if you take John out of the picture, in the epistles to the church. What does that tell you? God the Father is the appropriate personage of the being of God that continues to be active. It isn't like they tell you in oneness organizations that say he's God in creation, he's the Son in redemption, he's the Holy Spirit in regeneration. That doesn't tell the story. That isn't the way it works. It isn't one in one place and then he switches coats and now he's something else in another, and he switches coats, and now he's something else now. I, this lesson's gonna prove it to you. It, it, it just is. So, let's go to the next point. A significant point is this. The book of Revelation happened in 90, what, 6 AD. Every apostle was dead except John. 
Paul, Peter, James, Luke, none of those guys ever had the book of Revelation. They never saw it. They don't even know what was in it because it didn't exist. This book of Revelation is given to John from heaven. Guess who's there? Jesus. Guess what he's there as? No longer the son of man on the earth as a man, but in his full glory. And yet in his full glory, the father is referred to by him five times. Now, Jesus is the father. Why in the world in his glory is he still referring to the father? If he's the father and he's in his glory and he's in heaven, what's he doing still playing that role? Oh, well, that's what it is. He's playing a role. Come on. Do you really think God is just playing games with words? He doesn't mean what he says. He's playing like metaphorical games. This is not possible. Jesus in the book of Revelation is still referring to God the Father as the eternal relationship continues between him and God the Father. This is a significant detail that debunks the notion that there is no difference in the Son of God and the Father. It also proves that Jesus never states that he is to be seen as God the Father, to be viewed as God the Father, to be called God the Father, to be confused with God the Father. Am I saying Jesus isn't God? No way am I saying that. I'm saying the Son of God is as much God as God the Father is God and as the Holy Spirit is God. I want to address the one issue that's the strongest argument to make Jesus, Jesus God. You okay? Okay. Uh, John 14, 7 through 11. If you had known me, they asked him, you know, show us the Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Remember that Jesus said the same thing to Pharisees. Pharisees said, we don't know where you're come, you came from. We don't know who you are. Our father is Abraham. And Jesus said, if you would have known my Father, you would know me also because I proceeded from him. He didn't say he was acting as father before and he proceeded here because he was acting as son now. He didn't say that. That is very convoluted. It's simplistic. It's silly. It's not what the Bible teaches. But here he tells them while he's got his disciples together and he says, don't you know that if you knew me, you would have known my father also? And Philip goes, okay, I get it. I get it. Let me ask the question. Lord, show us the father and it is enough for us. He still don't get it. But Jesus says to him, have I been with you for so long a time and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? This is where one of those Pentecostals get anointed. And they really press in on this subject right here because they're thinking that what this is is that Jesus is saying, when you've seen me, I'm identically the Father. I am the Father. And I ask you, if you know English and you look at this close, is that what he's saying? I am the Father? If he is, why didn't he say that? And why didn't he declare that? But here, let's listen carefully to what he said. I've been with you for so long a time, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip. The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you, Philip, say, show us the Father? Do you, Philip, not know or not believe that I am God the Father? Is that what it says? Do you not know that I am God the Father? Why not? Wouldn't that settle the issue? Would for me. If I tell you I am her dad, the issue's over with. I am her dad. I'm telling you the truth. Here he said, do you not know? Uh, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in <laughs> the Father? And the Father is in me. Boy, that's some oneness there. 
The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. Wait, aren't you God the Father? Then you would be speaking that on your own. No, no, that's just his flesh. No, it's not. Watch. That means if that's the case, then the Son of God didn't exist until Mary got pregnant. And there was no Son of God in existence, only God the Father, right? That, that has to be where that logic goes. But that's not what the Bible teaches. What's, what's this? I do not speak on my own, but the Father, as he remains in me, does his work. Believe me that I am in, not I am God the Father. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Okay, got the picture. God the Father is a spirit. He fills the universe. And not only Jesus is in him, but so are all of us. But there's this other thing. Here's the explanation for, oh, and then, of course, the Father's in Jesus. Of course, he's the Son. He's, he has the Father in him. The explanation for this is, is this. Jesus is, according to Colossians 1.15, the image of the invisible God. Who's the invisible God? God the Father. Why is it that he can't show them the Father? Because the Father's invisible. Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because Jesus is the only image of God. He's the only visible presence of God. Because that's what God chose to show himself to the world. Jesus is the manifestation of the invisible God that no one has ever seen. That does not change the fact that what is being asked here is, show us the Father separate from you, the only image of the invisible God. And Jesus is saying, you don't understand what you're asking for. Because I am that express and only image according to Colossians 1.15, which we got later on after this event. This uh, alone explains it. God the Father is invisible. This does not mean that the Father is merely a mode of God, indistinguishable from his other modes. Otherwise, the following verse would be untrue and misleading. Let's stop there for a minute and go to that other verse, because I say too much and we're going to get lost. So I want to read the other verse I'm talking about. What did Jesus say here? John 6, 46. Jesus said these words, not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. He's either saying, I saw myself, or he's saying what he's saying. I have seen the Father. You can't see him, but I can see him. Wait, Jesus, just say it. You looked in the mirror and you saw yourself. That's not what he's saying. If he wanted to say that, he could have said that. But that's not what he was saying. That's not what he's teaching. That's not what he wants you to believe, or he would have said it differently. But he didn't say that. Now let's jump back up to my commentary. The Father is known and seen only by the Son. This is why Christianity has always and will always reject oneness modalism, which denies the distinguishability between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they are oversimplifying God's being and ignoring the hundreds of passages which go to great lengths to show these distinguishable features or factors about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And it is an error, to say the least. When people buy into this, a blindness sets in, and they can't see the God in the Bible because they have degenerated and corrupted what the Bible is saying, and they make it mean something it's not saying. And if the Bible was supposed to be saying what they say that it says, then he should have said it that way, because then we would all know what he meant. But he didn't mean that. He meant this. He meant what it said. So don't let that blindness get you to where you can't see it. You can't see it. So 
This stressing of God as Father cannot be missed once it has been pointed out. Jesus had to mark this distinction in order to make sense of who he was before the people who were listening to him, his own sonship. The oneness of God is a great term because God is one. In the Old Testament, when it talks about there is no other God formed before me, there is no other God after me, the oneness modalists think that that's saying there's no trinity. It's not saying that at all. It's saying there is no other being that is God other than this one. That's what it's saying. There is only one God, and that one God is one being. And he operates with such unity, you can't find any difference between any part of it, any part of him, because they are completely unified. And is that not what he's trying to do with a man and a woman in marriage? Is that not what he's trying to do in a man and a woman and their children? Is it not what he's trying to do between brother and sister in Christ? Unity. Complete harmony. Unity. God is the perfection of that, and he's trying to duplicate it in families, marriages, and the church. This is God's program. If you don't see this, you're missing a big part of the whole picture of what God's trying to do. So the oneness of God is great. It's not threatened with these obvious distinctions that Jesus brings to light in the New Testament. It merely introduces us to the being that is like no other created being and nor can it because God is unique. He's not created. He is completely different than anything that's created and when it comes to creatures. The being of God should never be confused with the being of man, nor, you should underline this part, any other created being. There is a mystery of God that is unknown and unknowable. Get used to it. You're never going to understand the being of God. Forget about it. You can't. You've never seen it before, therefore you can't understand it. <coughs> All you've seen are humans. All you've heard about are angels, but you have never seen an uncreated being. To pretend otherwise is to reduce God to human standards and to presume we comprehend the incomprehensible God of eternity. The simple truth is we cannot. The following quote that I want to share with you is taken from this website here, uh, bookofconcord.org. And I don't know what these people are about, but I read in, in Martin Luther's, one of his commentaries, this basic statement, and I was trying to find it fast, and I found it here. Listen to what Martin Luther says about this subject. Martin Luther most earnestly warns against all speculations concerning the hidden God as futile, foolish, presumptuous, and wicked. The secret counsels, the judgments, the ways of God cannot and must not be investigated. Look at that. This is, this is the, when I heard this the first time, it's like, oh my goodness. Why hasn't someone said that to me before? This is so wise to understand this. It can't even be investigated. Martin Luther says, in other words, to even try to look upon this subject is a sin. And you're full of pride if you think you can figure this out. He said, God's majesty is unfathomable. His judgments are unsearchable. His ways past finding out. Hence, there is not and there cannot be any human knowledge, understanding, or faith whatever concerning God in so far as he has not revealed himself. What's he saying? If God hasn't shown you in the Bible clearly about anything, you're not going to figure it out. Forget about it. Sit down and shut up <laughs> because it's pride to do so. For while the fact that there are indeed such things as mysteries, unsearchable judgments and incomprehensible ways to God uh, in God is plainly taught in the Bible. Their nature, their how, their why, their, 
the, and wherefore has not been revealed to us and no amount of human ingenuity is able to supply the deficiency. Hence, in as far as God is still hidden and veiled, he cannot serve as a norm by which we are able to regulate our faith and life, particularly when considering the question how God is disposed toward us individually. We must not take refuge in the secret counsels of God, which reason cannot spy or pry into. According to Luther, all human speculations concerning the hidden God, or the hidden parts of God, I would say, are mere diabolical inspirations bound to lead away from the saving truth of the gospel into despair and destruction. That's powerful. He's saying there's some things about God you're just not going to know and you're not going to be able to find out by speculating. The New Testament is clear that Jesus is God and he is so because he proceeded from God. His sonship was not at some time non-existent in eternity. This could not be so. He is the eternal son of God. He always was. Well, let's find out. Does the Bible say that? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, the glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. What was in the beginning? The Word. It wasn't, you know, Christmas when Jesus was born. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is an eternal sonship. And the Word, verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us. He came. He didn't, he didn't get born into it. He came from there to here. He told the Pharisees, I came from the Father. I came from somewhere. I was somewhere else, and I came here. This is important. I have been going an hour, so I... I'm going to be a good boy, and I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to finish next week. So let me tell you where we're going to go next week. Next week, we are going to go. We've went from God, the Father, and Jesus clarifying and defining that. And we know we're talking about the Son of God because we have Jesus as the Son of God who is the one revealing these things. Then we're going to go to the Holy Spirit. And when we get to the Holy Spirit, then we're going to see what Jesus did to define and prepare the world for the Holy Spirit with expectations as to what, what's he going to do? What's it going to be like? What, what is the goal? What is the work? What's it going to be? And he's going to define the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. These are the things we need to know before we get to Acts chapter 2 and see the birth of the church because all of this leads up to the church and it is all contextually set so that we can see how the father the son and the holy spirit bring about the salvation of man and the wonderful bride of christ the church of jesus christ and of course how the whole plan comes together with power with supernatural gifts with unbelievable fruit that comes from it and all the things that are expected to be in a person's life if they are full of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the goal of all of this is to entice, to encourage, and to see all of us get closer to that ideal of being filled with and full of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, and to see the things and the purposes Jesus describes happening in our life because we are still in the church age. And so just as we do not look to see what happens in the tribulation with our eyes, because we're not going to be here for that, we do want to look at what God intended to happen in the church, and we want to see that, because that is prophecy that is for us, where the great tribulation period is Jacob's trouble, and that's Israel, and Israel's trouble has nothing to do with the church. So that's why there is this distinction and this difference between these things. You've 
been listening to a Fathom Ministries podcast with me, Pastor Nathan Reynolds. You can find more podcasts and contact info at our website at www.fathomministries.org. Thank you for listening.